When I started to study with Franco, I was already seven years in the orchestra. So I came like playing on the fingerboard. It was good. But then he said, oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I really appreciate you tuning in. Visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what we're doing here. I love hearing people's stories. That's why I do this podcast, and I love it if you reached out and told me your story. And you can do that by emailing me at feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. I know you're going to love today's story about Christine Hook. Now, Christine has done it all. Orchestral playing, chamber music playing, and she's had an incredibly eclectic career as a soloist. Bach, electronic music, Philip Glass, tango, Arvo Pear, jazz, world music. It's amazing. It really is. And you'll be hearing excerpts from several of her recordings. And this is just a glimpse. This is a small glimpse into what she's put out. So check out her website for links to her recordings. And check her out on YouTube as well. There are dozens of videos of her performing. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Christine Hook. everybody know about your early musical experiences and how you discovered the double bass? Yeah, well, what was the, the school? I think it was, uh, well, I was playing the piano and this was, well, okay, nice, so I had no idea to going deeper in this. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was a teacher in the, in the school, by the way, like a girls' school, and uh, he said, oh, you, you have so great rhythmical, uh, we had to try something to knock on the tables, I don't know. I was quite good with the rhythm. And so he thought, oh, well, we need a bass in the school orchestra. But uh, so first, I, I didn't know at all what a bass is. So I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> not dance. It also didn't help when I asked my parents because they thought, well, no, she's mad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there was a bit the reason that it took so many years for me to start the bass. So this question of the teacher was quite important for me. Because I never had thought about going deeper in the music or being really interested. So this changed then uh, for some years. So I was, I was going to listen to orchestras or I, I, I listened different to, to music. And, um, yeah, somehow, well, I just needed five years to start then with the bass. Well, in fact, the percussion would be interesting for me. Yeah, I like this basic feeling for the, for the music, yeah, the rhythm is one of the basic things. So percussion was occupied. So yeah, then I started to look more on the bassists in, in, in symphony orchestras, and yeah, there was enough rhythm for me, so I liked it. <laughs> and and I like, of course, I like the the idea of the orchestra it was somehow my idea to find a harmonic together feeling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then I started with 16 directly being impatient of entering to the orchestra, school orchestra, of course. Mm-hmm. Who were some of your early bass teachers? It was somebody in my, my town who was a, also a school teacher. He played a little bit the bass. Yeah, I, I, I studied only exercises for some years. And then I was falling over this uh, Ludwig Streicher uh, LP, the Dittersdorf. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I think it was really the, the first LP I, I bought. It was the Striker. Nice, nice, the Dittersdorf. Oh, that's great. Well, that's com- great. Compare, compare to a Seamantle exercise, it was really like heaven. <laughs> a little more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but uh, this teacher, he, he helped me when I said, oh, you, you see, I found pieces for the bass, and he said, yeah, it is, of course, and then he asked me, uh, you want to do a little competition for children, I said, oh, wow, super, so, yeah, and then I shared this uh, children's competition, well, it, in fact, I think I was 17 then, or so, yeah, yeah, I was all, always 
interested and, and, and curious. And after this competition, I met somebody who said, oh, there's a good teacher in Frankfurt, this Günther Klaus already. And then I went to him, and then I started to study, and then it was quite fast. And I know that you studied both with Günther Klaus, and then you had a lot of experiences with Franco Petrachi. Uh, could you maybe just describe some of your experiences working with these artists? Yeah, so they are they are very different. So um, I like them both a lot. So they are very uh, passionate people for the music, and they are crazy for the bass. So even their sound is totally different. It was perfect to start with Günther Klaus, very basic, very safe techniques, very natural himself, very natural. This was important because I was also looking a lot. I was not so interested in intellectual sure. anything. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so I was a looker, just uh, I liked the energy. And so we find on a good wave and all the, I was nice. He was also nice, but because I was just doing the exercises he told me. Yeah. And this helped at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think uh, I still had this idea of really entering fast in an orchestra so the whole study with Gunther Klaus was a lot like uh, doing the technical things, doing a lot of orchestra excerpts. Uh, of course, um, I had no repertoire before when I started. I think when I did the entrance exam, I don't know what I played. I think Gordon Jacob concertino, so something very, very early things, or Capuzzi concerto, yeah. So I had a lot of uh, um, repertoire experience for and uh, when I when I ended in the orchestra, I just think I was ready with the Dittersdorf concerto. I did the Van Hal concerto, and I did the first two movements of Bottesini concerto. Oh, and with wow. this, I did. <laughs> 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 so, um, so it was really this way to the orchestra, and also because of this. So my feeling when I started with the orchestra was like, who? So that was. A fantastic step. Now I'm now I'm independent. This was very important for me, and now I'm also free for own musical ideas. And then uh, later I studied with Petraki, and this was then a part of this freedom of uh, that I, I looked myself for my own sound or more my own sound or more musical ideas, more the artistic side of of the bass playing. Petraki, it's such an amazing way of looking at the bass with the thumb position all over the instrument and the various intervals. There's so much logic to his to his approach, and it must have opened up your mind to all sorts of new possibilities on the instrument. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh -huh. So I got quite faster <laughs> yeah. with using using the thumb quite early. So that's that's very important thing. So I think the ideas with uh, using early the thumb and also to do a lot of uh, chromatic fingerings. So this is very important for the string crossings, yeah, fast string crossings. So this changed a lot of ideas. Also, of course, his bowing, even if he has the French bowing, was just looking on the bow, not on the bow hands so or how the bow was moving. And and this, this was great to, how to say, to translate this for German bow. That's fine. It was, it was very different. So somehow I... I kept the orchestra sound from Günther Klaus and I, I got then later the solo sound from Pretaki or this, this idea of, yeah, also, also singing or, or keeping big, big lines. Yeah. He uses that that close to the bridge kind of he some of elements of his playing kind of remind me of the way Gary Carr approaches the bass a little bit closer to the bridge slower bow that rich sound that must have been interesting uh, absorbing that into your playing yeah of course it's it's uh, well you never should play like this in the orchestra and then when I studied with when I started to study with Franco I was already seven years in the orchestra so I came like playing on the fingerboard it was good. But then he said, oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> There's the bridge. And this um, sound producing was totally different, also for the left hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the vibrato changed a lot. So the also the body feeling changed, of course. If your sound is more focused, the whole artistic feeling is different. Yeah, you feel like really, or you are able to really reach the, the audition 
yeah, if you can ask Gary Carr. Yeah, so he reads the audition, and that's uh, on, also on the stage. It's a totally different body feeling. Yeah, and that's, that is important. Yeah. I love looking through all the various pieces you've recorded and played, and it's remarkable all the different styles you play. You've got tango, which is such a I, – I love tango bass. It's such a fascinating style that's so percussive and so much energy to the style. How do you discover new pieces for the bass? Um, yeah, I'm curious. So, And I like to, to see the entire instrument. So for me, there are so many pieces um, being too solistic, always playing the thumb position, and people say, then, oh, I really like a cello. <laughs> and I, go, oh, no. <laughs> I really like the pieces, like having earthy ideas and also the singing ideas and the combination. So it's a great thing. So I look also for pieces or for programs which have both of it, yeah, the earthy sound, and if you know my CDs, I'm always looking, playing together with different people, yeah? So for me, there is not, not only a, a chamber music bass, besides the orchestra and the solo bass, there's also the solo chamber music bass, yeah? So do, uh, if you play the uh, Prokofiev quintet, this gives an idea of this, yeah? This part is really like a solo chamber music, yeah? I think you played it, yeah? Oh, I played so it, yes. Really yeah, yeah, it's it's really different. You, you started to cry because <laughs> he didn't he didn't compose a piece for us. <laughs> Why he understands everything? So this piece is really great, and that's the idea of um, I'm also looking for. Yeah, they are, um, so playing a lot together with other people. This in this moment, your sound changes. Yeah, you, I'm not a person who has his sound, and then the rest shall can come with me or not. I'm interested to build something new. Yeah. All the rest is boring for me. And maybe that's also one reason that I went so far now to this uh, electronic program, because this is really crazy change uh, than uh, possible. That's something you've been experimenting with more recently, right? Electronics and yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that experience been like getting into that? I was, in fact, it was. Uh, I did two CDs with a with a sound engineer together, and I thought, oh, that's a really crazy young guy. So, so what are you doing besides this? Oh, I'm DJ and so, and I am touring with some bands and so. Then, oh, wow, maybe we should do one day something. And then I think, uh, I don't know if you know this CD. I was a part of it uh, for the Skodanibiu thinking of, you know this? It's Sebastian Grams, so he took us together. Yeah. And then I did the recordings I did also with this DJ. And we were just looking to each other and said, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. Wow, we could do a lot of really crazy things with things like this, yeah. And then after this, we we met to getting more crazy ideas together, and so yeah, and we found somebody making some videos uh, with it, and yeah. So I like creative ideas. I get impatient if something, <laughs> if I'm missing something. So if the creativity is missing in my life or in my playing, that I feel like. 
one way like this, and the other is just unpatient. Then I have to look for something that's coming from inside. <laughs> well, it's, it's exciting that you're experimenting with the electronics because that's such a vibrant area of music right now that's really taken off. And it's, there are so many possibilities of what you could do with the bass and electronics and it's, it's, it's great that you're, that you're exploring. I think it's a whole world that's just beginning to be tapped into. Yeah, it's really a big world. Yeah, yeah. So I, I adore like, uh, Garcia Fons is doing this. Yeah, that's, I'm not crazy enough or not, not technical enough to do it <laughs> like, like him. So I don't do my own loops and yeah. so. So, so we really do like this that we do a, a duo or a trio together with piano and the, the, the DJ is playing an instrument. So I'm not doing the techniques myself. So, so somehow we do um, communication with the electronics. Uh, yeah, I would love. I like the Garcia von Sau is is all in his own hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm doing like like give it it, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we see. So it's yeah. always different. Also. got a new CD coming out in the fall. Maybe talk a little bit about what's going to be on that CD in terms of pieces and uh, artists. Yeah, it was a, a, a wish and an offer from, from my university to make this CD. And then when I said, oh, I have so many ideas, so we can do a double CD. And they said, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, maybe we can... Uh, I would like to record the Thind Eisen Concerto, this crazy piece, yeah. And then uh, Paul Shihara, he wrote also a concerto for me. Can we do this too? Oh, yes, okay. It was really, ooh, I was really lucky. So it's somehow, again, a bit my idea to make the, the sound of the bass world, like uh, starting with normal solistic uh, pieces, traditional, like the Bobsini Elegy of Tarantella I play there. And um, there are also some some... Colleagues included, like the Benjamin Schmidt playing the violin, we do the Botticini and and then we played also the from uh, Mozart, the Mozart um, from Français, Mozart New Look, mm, mm-hmm. the, with the wind ensemble, and well, then we have this solo pieces. Then my class is also involved. We do this Hummel octet. And the Tabakov 12 Tet, and there's also this, uh, this we're just talking about, we call a space space, this, um, electronic the electronics, um, yeah. things. So it's, it's, uh, a mixture, starting with very normal sound, like romantic piece, also called Nita as well, so on it. Then, um, switching to bass concertos and to contemporary music, also to own pieces, so it's, yeah, part of my base idea. I wanted to do a third <laughs> CD, uh, like also uh, including real chamber music, like the Prokofiev or, or Schulhoff trio or so. But then they were like, uh, okay, <laughs> first we do this too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice. Uh, yeah, I was very happy because uh, in our days, uh, if you don't find somebody who sponsors you, how to solve this. Right. Very hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, you've done a lot of teaching over the years, and it'd be interesting to hear just a little bit about your experiences working with bass players and some of the issues that they struggle with. What What have you found that bass players struggle with the most? I think first, the uh, um, not positioning. What the words for Shit. high, high tone? Uh, can... Oh, posture. Posture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was a word with the... <laughs> <laughs> So that's one very important thing because the the body and the instrument it's also communication. The whole thing is communication from the first moment. Yeah? So the posture to really be um, one one thing with your bass 
that's one of the important things. So, so if you block one of your feet mm -hmm. or one of your toes or one of your, I don't know, so this will block your sound. It takes energy from the, from your, from your focused sound. Sure. Yeah. So sure. that the, your body is and the bass is somehow one system and there should nothing be blocked in your body to find, to, to, to have a perfect string vibration. At the end, I'm, I'm just focused on the string vibration. But to come in this point to do uh, the string vibration I want, it's not just uh, playing on the bridge, doing this or that vibrato. So the posture, how your feet stand on the floor, yeah, you should be really like anchored in the, in the floor. You start The sound produce, production starts there. So that's one very uh, important thing. And when, when I see this quite late with a student, it's, uh, um, it's not easy to make it really like um, the movement fluently. So I, I do some, when I see somebody like this having somewhere, even if the knee or something is a bit blocked or doesn't look quite totally free, so they have to walk around their base while playing scales and just to, to get a feeling for the body. I don't know how you experience if So sporty people or people have a natural movement moving, it's easier for them. Yes. If somebody enters the door like, uh, <laughs> hello, my name is... Uh, Ui. So it's very seldom that people like this have a very natural movement on the base. Interesting. So it starts really early <laughs> yeah. with the sound producing. And um, I'm playing standing. I don't know how uh, you did. so I, I, I do too, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for this, for the people who play standing, it's even more important uh, to have really a good body feeling to support the string vibration. But then there are normal things like... Uh, vibrato and there you also have you, you quite often have the reason about the pressing that people don't press from the front they play, they press from the back side yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the position so i think my experience is that the spiccato when i started to to teach a lot of people had more troubles with spiccato than now oh interesting so I, think, I think teachers are much better now Wow. Yeah, so in the last 15 years, I think, the people get better lessons. Do you think they're focusing more on bow strokes at an early age? Is it, are teachers focusing on the right arm more than they were 15 years ago? Or I wonder what's changed. I think the, the teachers play better themselves. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a, I really think uh, 15 years ago, it could happen that you get lessons from a cello teacher when you start as a, as a child. And I think this, this change and this is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, I think the, the classical style, it's still, it's still difficult for the people. Why? It's because everything has to be perfect to play an easy flowing classical style. Yeah. And if you have some, some little trouble as well, it starts with, if you don't always really control your intonation, to be able to articulate also in the middle of your bow, to don't have clear ideas, to don't uh, understand how, how much bars the phrase has. So in the, in the, in the romantic, I don't say it's easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Quite often, oh, it's so high, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm, it's difficult, okay, but the classical style, this easiness, yeah. it's really hard. Mm -hmm. so if you bring too much uh, uh, ego in your sound, classic will be dead. Yeah. yeah. So it's in the Baroque style, so also very, very hard. If you play with too much ego, it's like, oops, so... It's not anymore there, and the classical, classical style is also thing. I think the classical style, it's, it's still, it's still hard to understand and hard to play. So I understand because, uh, there are so much in, in the, what, singing pieces, or so, so much thumb position difficulties and fast, and the young guys, they, they want to be fast and uh, 
we are. <laughs> and then this easiness makes the people really good. Mad. <laughs> yeah. You have to be. You have to be patient. You have to to practice slow. Mm -hmm. So if you do the some Paganini things and there's one note in between, so like so so. Okay, but in the classic, no, no, they they all have to be in the line, clear. They all have they have a goal. So that, so this is a is a quite important. Uh, thing to work on a lot of people struggle with this yeah. it's hard because it's it's the music that to an outside listener it sounds the easiest the most effortless yeah. but it's actually the most challenging to actually get get all those pieces in place it's like in life so yeah. the, the easy things are also <laughs> the most always the most difficult yeah quite yeah. often yeah. <laughs> In terms of technical materials like uh, method books, etudes, or specific pieces, what what do you like to have students work on? Um, where shall I start? Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I always say, so the most important things, so listen to intonation. This means practice slow. That's somehow <laughs> unreachable, yeah? And before you practice, understand why you practice, yeah? That's really hard. So, well, I was also young and didn't sing at all. So that's a hard thing, but it's very effective if you understand why we do this and um, to reflect after practicing. So that's the basic things. Of course, scales and the chord studies, they're important. But I always say you don't practice now the scales because I want you to, to practice scales. Right. Yeah. Right. I want you to practice a scale that you take your time to meditate mm. when you play the slow scale, mm. your bow arm and all your movements on your standing, intonation, sound that you play on the bridge. So, but then one week later they come and da 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 da, da no. <laughs> so the self-reflecting that's that's a really hard thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the traditional things I, I like to do a lot, yeah. The technique which fits good to the um, orchestra excerpts or the, the piece they are just playing, yeah. It's hard for people to get that focus that you're talking about, regardless of what they're practicing, having that focus and, and reflecting. Yeah. It saves, it spares so much time. Yeah. Well, while my first studies, I was, like I said, you, I didn't think about much. I, had to practice so much things and but at the end somehow uh, intuitively i did somehow the right thing thing playing once the concerto or the piece i just played slow and then i stopped yeah just for to reflect i always did this last five minutes meditation playing slow so um it's it, it's uh, spare so much time but of course yeah you you feel lonesome as a teacher, like <laughs> <laughs> because I can I can understand this, but it's uh, it just takes your time and your energy if you always practice too fast. You you, you practice the faults. You wrote a line to me uh, that in in your email that I really like. You you said, "I say hello to my instrument and to my own daily condition," and I love that because it it really is. You're kind of your. I w I didn't get as much sleep to last night as I did the night before. I ate something a little different. I'm in a different place. My base, the humidity is different, and I like the idea of starting with your practice by just introducing yourself to your instrument and how you're feeling in that day. That's a mm -hmm. that's an interesting concept. Yeah, it would be a, a good to do this uh, with myself also mm -hmm. each morning. I, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was, would also be a good thing in life. Yes. When you're awake to just notice, mm -hmm. okay, how I am, mm -hmm. how are you, so how's the weather, and mm -hmm. how do I really feel? And uh, with the bass, I can do this. So 
okay, hello my race, how I am. So just to, to connect. Yeah, it's important. When I listen to your recordings, when it, one of the first things that strikes me is your sound. You have this beautiful sound, and it's a different kind of sound, like you were saying earlier, a different kind of sound for the different pieces. Uh, it's not just one sound. But I'd love to know what you do to work on sound, or maybe advice you might have for younger players working on developing their tonal range. Well, at, the, at first, it's like um, advice for the students – well, do a lot of experience. Play, play all these pieces you have to play. And then maybe do it one year later again and reflect and really listen more. First, they are quite busy with all the te technical stuff. I understand this. And a lot of people forget to listen themselves. If you always listen to yourself, that helps a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> helps you play really in tune. So if you play false, so if your ears are not met, most people really have good ears. So if you really no, um, uh, listen to your intonation, you will not play false. If you really listen to your, your, your sound, you will get some ideas. And with these ideas, you should experiment. Yeah, uh, um, a lot of people try to, yeah, they, they play the, the, the pieces and try to make it okay. And when I get the question, shall I make here a crescendo? That, that makes me crazy. <laughs> so what's your idea of the piece? Yeah. So some people, they don't start really with having ideas. So I think the leading yourself from starting practicing from the first note of the scale till the moment on stage so this leading yourself is an important thing. And the, the ears, they are so powerful instruments yes. <laughs> to help you. Yeah? Right. They are the most powerful. And this moment you are the own teacher. And the, the teacher, like me, we, we can help like, oh, take care here. Your fingers are like this, take care. The bow isn't really straight. Go to the bridge, okay. But we have to support the own ideas that the people find their own uh, uh, musicality. Yeah. yeah, it all comes from the idea. That's a great, that's something that students struggle with so much. And like like you said, they, they're they asking about these little minute things like a crescendo here, decrescendo there, but they, they miss the whole concept of, the, they don't have a, an idea of what they want to do with the piece. So from, from my own, when I, from my own side as an artist, it's really like... Um, I cannot say that I hear so much music and I don't know, I want to find something. It's, uh, so by chance that my ears get like this. Mm -hmm. I was on the, for the tango music. Yeah. Like, like, whoops, what's this? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, oh, let's try to play the grand tango. I will see how this works on the bass. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's curiosity. And that, of course, that's the easiest way. And somehow I'm, I'm more like waiting for this moment that uh, some passion takes me with it. When I start to think about, oh, can we do something new? Then, oh, then I, <laughs> usually I, I give up or then I prefer to, to play some from our traditional repertoire. It's not so bad. So, of course, traditional repertoire is important. But the, the ideas, or I, I always love the world music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I, I love jazz music, but I'm not a jazz player. So why not playing together with jazz musicians? So I remember the time when I was still in the orchestra in the, in the 
also in Cologne, there's a, a great um, big band, and John Goldsby plays there. Mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah, John Goldsby. <laughs> and we, we we gave us lessons. Oh, nice. <laughs> so so uh, we, we are both very curious, and he asked me, hey, how do you play this with the bow? And I said, and I said how do you make this yeah. with your busy cattle? <laughs> and you had very funny uh, lessons giving us. And then we, we play also together and that's, that's nice experience. And that's the idea of communication. Yeah. I like. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Now, now you you travel all over the place. You travel, and and surely, and you you shared a couple with me. But it's traveling with a base is always interesting. Do you have maybe one or two particularly tough travel stories you'd want to share? Well, the, I think that the, the toughest was the, the this Moscow story when I, I was there giving master classes and and I played also concerts. So I thought, okay, going the first time there, I think it's good to bring my own base. And, um, okay, everything was done. And, um, so I entered the airport. It was also, it's some years ago. It was the first time that, they, that some dogs were waiting for my base. Oh, no. From the airport. <laughs> and, okay, but then I passed this and then I got, I, I went to the counter of the, it was a, a German, uh, airline but uh well okay then they said uh okay sorry you have to pay extra and so, so I, I paid before and i brought this proof that i paid before and then oh, no, this doesn't interest us so, <laughs> this is moscow you know that's different <laughs> it's a terrible one moment and then i really i, I tried to make anger there i, I tried to call the airline I was running around. I, I couldn't believe because they they, they wanted uh, eight hundred euro extra for oh, this. Wow! And um, yeah, at the at the end, uh, they didn't accept my credit card. It was really like <laughs> I, I paid this. I paid this. I think twenty minutes before I uh, they they said oh. to stay here. Yeah, I was really angry, and I, and I wrote uh, letters after this when mm -hmm. I was here to the airline. But <laughs> yeah, it didn't help. So yeah, it's it's not easier now. It will be worse and worse, I think. Yeah, yeah. well, and Russia is a hard country to travel around. I did a I did a festival in Russia, this American Russian Youth Orchestra, and we half Americans, half Russians, and yeah, it was pretty wild taking a base on the. On the flights and dealing with all of that. You were talking about, you, you talked a bit about the album that's coming out in the fall. What else is coming up in the next six months, 12 months in terms of master classes or that kind of thing? Yeah. So the next master class is, uh, in, in August in Italy. It's a nice little festival in, in near Venice. So it's a very nice town close to the beach and there it's like a chamber music. First of all, I am doing the, the bass master class. So that's a great thing. So, uh, because it's six days and six lessons. Yeah, nice. So yeah. lots, lots of lessons and, uh, concerts and so in, well, the, the bass, bass 2016 in Prague, I will be there with the concerts and master class. I join also the, the Barry Green. Event there. With That's <laughs> right. You're playing for, yeah. You know, the first, the Barry, uh, the, uh, two days ago or three days ago just played the first performance here in, uh, oh, yeah, at San yeah, Francisco. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. yeah. yeah. He asked me to play a tango there in this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. In this recital. Yeah. Nice. And then I, uh, go to the, another master class to, um, Sweden, that's also a, a great uh, event for the students. So there's a lot of orchestra stuff to play with mm -hmm. Son of a Mariner's conductor, a lot of chamber music, and I'm doing the uh, bass master class at this time. And, uh, well, and I like to, to, to invite also the 
some colleagues from my class, so Jeff Bertich is coming, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. also a nice, nice thing. So the contacts uh, with, with the colleagues is very important. So. Thanks again, Christine, for the great conversation. And check her out at her website, christinehook.de. And just a little bit of feedback. Noah Yannicki emailed in and said a couple things. First, incredible podcast about Sam. That's Sam Suggs. That's a couple episodes ago, which is amazing, by the way. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. What an interesting guy. So Noah continues, it's so cool to hear him play again after all this time since high school. He's a monster bassist, and I'm glad you were able to interview him. Second, I don't know if this is of relevance, but the Mountain and the Moon has currently advanced to the finals for the duo competition at Freshgrass in September. It's pretty cool. Thought it just might be worth mentioning to you. So Noah has a duo, the Mountain and the Moon, with banjoist Casey Holmberg. Interesting stuff. Check them out if you haven't. It's a great find. You'll have a blast. Really energetic, cool uh, music. I love it. It's themountainandthemoon.net. And Joe Tuzinski wrote in and he says, wow, I just listened to the Matthew McDonald podcast, which again, this is Jason jumping in. Check that podcast out if you haven't. What an amazing episode. That was one of those, again, I listened to when I got done and I said, I feel like my life is 10% better after just having that conversation and listening to him. So cool. Okay, so Joe continues. Lots of great stuff, but for me, the paradigm shattering idea was concerning specific exercises not being important, but knowing what you're looking for is. For years, I've been obsessed with finding the perfect set of warm-ups, haven't we all, and technique building exercises for my daily routine that will cover everything. What a backwards way of doing it. I just made a list of 13 concepts I want to work on today, and I have a feeling that I'll know exactly what to do for each one. And Joe, I just realized I did email you back, but I forgot to ask for your list. Dude, send me your list. I'd love to check that out. Again, I'll say it again because we're just coming up. Prague 2016. Are you going to be there? Go if you can. I'm fortunate in that I no longer have a 60-hour-a-week full-time job, so I can go to Prague. Yay! And I will be, since I can do that, I will be being as much of service to the base community that can't go to Prague, and I'm going to get as many interviews. I'm going to do everything I can to document this event and share it with you. And I'm hoping to do that for all these events coming up because I know so many of us. And for me, for the last seven years, I couldn't go to ISB. I couldn't go to anything. I can just leave my job for a week, but now I can. And I want to use that freedom to be of service. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm excited. And if you're going to be there, let's connect. You know how to get in touch with me. So again, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You could be doing so many things right now, but you're listening to this podcast and it's an honor, it's a privilege. And I know Christine appreciates it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Visit our website. If you want to learn, if you're new to the podcast and you want to learn about my mission, what I'm trying to do here for the last almost 10 years, we've been doing this and it's such a thrill to work on this podcast every day. It's just such a great way to be spending my time. Thank you for spending your time here, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>